Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet an artist who is a painter, a gallery curator, and a musician. And uh, they do pop art. They do uh, what they describe as pop art. And it, it, it is. It's uh, very. It's stuff based on very retro things, uh, sort of repurposing ideas with different concepts, pairing them with words. And uh, they also created a online virtual gallery. And it's one of those things where it's like, you've seen them before, but it's just, they, they were like, let's do a show and people can buy the artist's art directly from it. And they're curating it and you can walk through and check it out. It's, it's a fun idea. And the whole thing is just based on using this service already to display their own art in room settings. The person just really thinks of different ways to use the tools that are already available to them to create more, to promote more, to try and find different avenues for their work. So it's a fun conversation and I learned a lot. Here it is starting right now. I don't know why I'm pausing. Here it goes. My name is Amanda Weirig. Uh, I am a painter, a mixed media artist, a musician and a uh, pretty new gallery owner. Yeah, so. I, I saw the gallery thing. And uh, also, what, what are you just trying to show me up by all the things you can do? It's, that's that's <laughs> awesome that you got, you got a big portfolio like that. Now, first of all, where are you located? I am in Minneapolis. Okay. Have you lived there for long? No, I've only been here for a little over a year. Okay. Um, I was living down in Mankato before this. Mankato is about oh hour and a half southwest of Minneapolis. Um, so I was there. Um, it's actually my hometown, and um, okay. I lost my. I, I was um, I was working in nonprofit arts administration, and uh, I was an executive director. And with the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know how hard it hit the arts industry. Well, my job was eliminated. So I decided to just uproot and and come to where there were more opportunities. So, and so it was I'm just here. kind of a whim, or there was actually well, something you were pursuing there in particular. It was something I'd been wanting to do for quite a while, okay. and once once the job was gone, and and that was really the only thing that was keeping me there. It was like I really have no excuse not to just do this. Yeah. So I just I just took the leap and and went for it. I don't know if I've ever been to Manitoba. I feel like I recognize the name, but also it's just a, it's a catchy name. I like saying it. I just wanted a chance to say Manitoba. Oh, it's Mankato. <laughs> oh, then what am I thinking of? What Mankato? You said I'm Canada. <laughs> oh my God, you're we right. I'm th enough, I've been but... watching. I've been watching Letter Kenny lately, so I think I might have just automatically put uh, a Canadian town in there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I'm glad that you knew where it was though. Here I was saying the name of the town and I didn't even know where it was. And you're like, it's in Canada. <laughs> I mean, we're not that far from the border. So that's, I, you know, that's true, but at the same time, well, maybe uh, you're closer than I am. I'm in the, the Southern part of Wisconsin and mm -hmm. you're in the, the Northern part. Well, Northern, no, I guess like, mi middle. Like, I got to stop yeah. pretending I know geography. So I'll just move on <laughs> from here. <laughs> Clearly I, I don't. Uh, so, <laughs> it's just all cold. <laughs> so when you were when you were living in this town that started with an M, uh, where, what uh, what kind of stuff were you doing there artistically? Um, so I had an art studio there. Um, I was painting. Um, I was working on a mural that actually just went up uh, last year. Um, oh, what was the mural? You know, um, so downtown Mankato, they call it Old Town, and um, you know it's like. It was the little center of commerce when when it was you know horses and buggies and things like that. And oh. there was an old storefront, um, and this store is called Maholds, and they sold sporting goods and toys and bikes and you know hunting gear and that kind of thing. And it was kind of a little hub for the community. Okay. And a friend of mine owns a record store that's in that building now, and I'd been wanting to do a mural on the side of that building. It's perfect location so I ended up working with the building owner and she really wanted to feature that old storefront and she found a picture of it from like the 40s or 50s oh, so wow. I turned it into a big pop art mural and put it on the side of the building so okay 
And yeah. I have noticed that about your work. That's what you just described there is a lot of what I see in the work that you do. It seemed in, in animation, a lot of it is referred to as rotoscoping, I think. And is that kind of the style that you're doing or what is, what is the way that you go about recreating these photographs or um, altering them? Or I guess I don't know what it would be called. What would you call that? Um, I mean, I just call it pop art, I guess. Okay. I mean, I'm definitely influenced by like mid-century stuff, pop culture. I love old advertising and like old jazz album covers and mm -hmm. all of that, you know, the whole Mad Men kind of thing. I love that stuff. And uh, what I'll usually do is if I find a photo or something that I want to work from, I'll put it in Photoshop, mm -hmm. turn it black and white, and then assign colors to the different values. So really? the colors won't, you know, if it's a color photograph, the colors won't match up. Right. Or if it's already black and white, then I'm just a color assigning colors to those. So I can go with whatever I want to, which is, you know, what pop art is. I mean, Warhol did stuff where, you know, Marilyn Monroe had like, you know, garish colors on her right. face, you know? Yeah. Um, so I go about it that way. We're like, what's the darkest, what's the lightest, what's in between. And then what colors do I want to use for those? Yeah. And then apply those. It's kind of like turning it into my own paint by numbers, I guess. Right. And also uh, you were mentioning the jazz covers too, and then mentioned Warhol. One of my favorite things that I saw too at the, uh, I was at a Warhol gallery recently and I never knew about his jazz album covers. Have you seen those? You know, just a little bit. Yeah, I have they're really cool. <laughs> I, I had no idea that they were like, it seemed like a couple of them were just ones that he kind of did on, you know, the down low. And then the ones after that were signed. But the style yeah. in them, I just keep forgetting that he also was uh, like, he was more like fashion design and stuff. And that's really what those photos are. Anyway, I just thought they were cool. You mentioned yeah. it and it made me think of that. But uh with the so when you were creating this into a mural, like with the method that you're talking about, um, and on your website, they are also paintings. So, do you transfer them over? Like, what's the process when you start one of these projects? Uh, with the mural projects, yeah, yeah. So, um, I use uh, it's it's kind of a newer method, it's called polytab or parachute cloth. And, um, what it is, it's, it's this cloth, I, I ordered mine out of Philadelphia. Um, but I can put my design into Photoshop, blow it up, send the image off to the company, and then I can order a roll of fabric that's pre-primed. I had a ghost image printed on as well. Okay. And then I got a roll of 15 different panels. And all oh. I did was cut off each panel, tack it on the wall, and then paint over that ghost image. So I still did all the painting by hand. Right. We can do it indoors, which is great for Minnesota because, right, you know, <laughs> snowing half the year or yeah. it's godly hot. So, um, you know, I could work on the mural all throughout the year. And then when the weather is nice, you just basically glue the mural to the building and then apply varnish over it. Oh, that's not even the way I was thinking you... Uh... <sighs> So you're saying it's something that you can prepare, then when you're done, you can put it up where it's supposed to go. Yes. Yeah. As long as the oh. surface is prepared, it just sticks on. And it actually lasts longer than the ones that are just painted directly on the building. Yeah. Those last like 10, 15 years. These can last um, 25 years or more. So they're more durable and weather resistant. I have never heard of this. Okay. How did you discover this? There's an organization over in St. Paul called Forecast Public Art. Okay. And I had reached out to them a few years ago. I told them I wanted to start getting into murals. And um, they gave me a free phone consultation and told me about this process. So I started looking into it. And I'm like, this is brilliant. Because yeah. I don't want to sit outside and paint when it's 95 degrees. Right. So um, so I went with that. And and I will never do anything else. I love it. I feel, I, I feel like you just discovered a way to become a mural artist remotely. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, pretty much. You, you can, that's awesome you clients anywhere and as long as you have all the specs you need you can just paint it in your studio and then take the mural where it needs to go yeah but how do, so how do you put it up i guess that would be the next thing that i would worry about like the the way that it's actually fastened attached or glued or how's it put onto the surface or the place where it's supposed to go so you use this stuff called gel medium 
Um, a lot of artists will use it, like mix it with paints and things like yeah. that thickener but you know you get like a five gallon bucket of it put gel medium on the wall and you want it like a pretty thick coating and on the back of the panel Mm -hmm. and then you stick it on and use um you know those like wallpaper smoothers or Mm -hmm. squeegees you know it's kind of like putting up wallpaper okay so put it up that way you know and then just make sure everything lines up let it sit for a day or so and then you can apply like three, four coats of clear varnish over it. Yeah. The, the varnish dries pretty quickly. And then and then you're set. You just have to reapply varnish like maybe once a year. Um, huh. Otherwise, it's, you know, it, it holds up in rainstorms and snow and yeah. everything. As long as the humidity is right, and the temperature is right, you're good. Okay. I feel like I've, I mean, I know I've never heard of this before and I wonder if like, I'm the only person who's never heard of this. It's, it seems so, you know, it makes so much sense, but at the same time, I'm like, how, how am I unaware of this? Huh? Well, you know, I don't think a lot of artists know about it yet. I took a public art workshop last weekend and, and they talked about this process and I think there were only two of us in the room that had used it. Like most people just assume that, you know, you'd project it onto a wall and paint directly onto that. They, they hadn't even heard of it. So. Yeah. That's the way I always assumed it's one of those things. And this happens all the time. And also it happens a lot on this podcast where it's something where I just think you go about doing it this way. And then someone goes, well, you know, and it seems obvious, like projecting on a wall, for example, like you were just saying, like, that seems so obvious you would do it, but you know, that actually gets distorted and you have to have it at the right angle and you're covering it. Like there are problems involved with it, but going, why don't you just print it out onto a piece of paper, not a piece of paper, but print it out onto this thing and then apply that to the wall and then boom, you're done. And it's like, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, it's something that's like, it was right there. (laughs) If you want to skip the painting process, you can have them print the actual right. mural on the fabric too. And then you don't even have to paint. You just put it up. Right. And you can just sit at home and collect these checks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> it would be. You can just send murals over to different places and go, hey, want to put this up? <laughs> Actually, that could be an option. I don't know. Just create gigantic ca- canvases and repurpose. Oh my God, you could do that. Huh. Yeah. Anyway, I couldn't, but I don't have that kind of pull. But, you know, it's, people could actually move murals that they have to different places in the world. Interesting. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. My mind is, my mind is rushing with things that I'm unable to accomplish. Um, <laughs> so in talking about the style that you do um, with some of the pains you have, like, say, on, on your website, you have examples of your work there. And also, of course, you've been posting other places online. Tell me about how you start one of your projects. Like, what's the pro- how do you how do you decide this is what I'm going to do? And then how do you go about it? And how did that evolve over time? Oh, boy. You know, I used to really try to focus on working in a series. That was like the big thing when I was out of college, you know, they were like, everybody wants a series and everything has to look similar. If you're going to have a gallery show, you Mm -hmm. know, this was like 20 years ago. So initially that's kind of what I focused on, unless I was doing a one-off commission for somebody. But now um, since I use a lot of text in my work and a lot of humor and things like that, Mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll, run across something or I'll just get a phrase in my head randomly and I won't know where it's coming from, but it just sticks there. And and then, you know, eventually I'll come up with an image that fits that and then just go with that. So I haven't been focusing so much on this, the series part of it because I feel like my style is cohesive enough where mm-hmm. if you see a gallery of my work, you're going to know it's mine. Um, well, and I feel like it would be kind of limiting too, because that means that you have to, you can't do something unless it involves this or that. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And unless I'm working on a special project, I don't want to limit myself to that because you don't know where your ideas are going to come from. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I just did a commission for somebody who wanted something that was mid-century kind of jazz inspired. And I ended up using, um, imagery that I, I I was on a residency in Tennessee last fall and I went to an antique Mm -hmm. shop and I found this, this kid's book of magic tricks from the fifties. And it had these cool designs with hands on them. And I ended up incorporating those hands into the design. Like were they gloved hands? 
No, they were just like outline kind of cartoonish. And then they had like rubber bands on them, you know, like somebody doing the tricks. Oh, okay. Um, okay. I was trying to think of if I had the book because I have a couple of old fifties kids magic books. <laughs> oh, do you really? Yeah. Maybe. yeah. <laughs> it's an old scholastic book. Yeah. But like, I, I picked this up because I was just so intrigued by the illustrations and I'm like, you know, what am I going to do with this? It's just been sitting in my apartment. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the right project comes along and it's like, oh, this, this works, you know? And then you just incorporate these little elements of things into what you're already doing. Yeah. And when you're trying to work with a series, I think you really limit yourself that way. And mm -hmm. I don't want to yeah. do that. And with the, uh, I noticed that you've been using a lot of comic book art in your stuff as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Some Wonder Woman stuff. Uh, I believe there were some robots and uh, yeah. how, now, how are you? How are you putting those in there? Are you repainting those, or are you? Are, is it collage? I'm I'm curious because then it's also layered on like background stuff. And and really, I'm curious because I've been trying to figure out ways to repurpose some old comic books that I have. So really, I'm asking oh. for myself. How do you go about doing those things? Um, it depends on the piece. Like I have a Wonder Woman piece where it's painted. You know, kind of doing the Lichtenstein thing where painting a comic panel and then changing the text and things to what I needed. Okay. But then I have a, a collage piece where um, I use an old map of Minneapolis from, I don't know, 25 years ago. And then I drew Superman and Wonder Woman on top of that and then markered it and then put in rubber stamps and collage and other things layered it on. But okay. they're, they're actually drawn on. And then the other stuff is collaged on top of that. It is. So. Okay. It is. So you're cutting yeah. those out and okay, you are. Um, that's the yeah. part that I'm having trouble with. I, for some reason, I just, okay. There are two reasons. I can't why bring I'm myself having... to destroy a vintage comic book. Thank you. That was the <laughs> first thing I was going to say. I can't do that part. Like I know I could cut something out and I'm like, well, I could take a picture of it and do it digitally, but it never looks the same. It doesn't layer right. Even though you have all these masking and layering and, you know, uh, opacity, options it just doesn't look the same as if i were able to cut it or when i see things that are like cut out and clearly done before photoshop was made yeah but that's my biggest thing is and then when i cut it out like if i do it wrong it's like well now this is just hosed you know it's <laughs> it, 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 it so i know that once i'm done it could be something cool but if i screw it up then it just feels so the whole process there's just so much pressure I know I'm adding way too much weight to this, but <laughs> no, no, I get it because I, as an artist, like I put so much work into the stuff that I create and mm. knowing what that artist put into that comic book, yeah. like I can't destroy oh, somebody's yeah. work, you know? Right. And I, know it's like, it's stupid. It's a piece of paper, but like mm -hmm. knowing the value that my stuff has for me, like I can't bear the thought of destroying somebody else's work like that would just break my heart you know right yeah, yeah. The, o the only thing i've been trying out or that i just started trying out like literally a couple days ago um i saw something and i'm doing it wrong or i'm not using the right tools apparently but there's a way that i've seen people do it on youtube where they take comic book art or uh, something from a comic book they scan it and change it to black and white print it out on a piece of paper and then put that face down on a collage with like, you know, they put gesso on there or something like that, yeah. put that down and then rub it off of the paper, like disappears. But the, where the line art is, it stays. Yeah. I cannot get yeah. that to work. I don't know if I'm doing it wrong or they're not telling me something or I didn't research it enough, but I tried it. And basically all I did is I, there was some line art on there and there was a bunch of shredded paper on there. I, you know, it was all wet and everything. So I'm rubbing it off the way it's supposed to with a sponge and it wouldn't stay. And it's probably just my own ignorance and the fact that I just started it like a day ago. But uh, yeah, that's, so that's the one method where I'm like, maybe it's okay to do it this way. If I just use the line art and I can color it in myself. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe the gel that you're using to transfer it may just not be the right kind. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Because it's it it was flawless when the person that I saw do the video did it. And I'm like, that's not the same at all. <laughs> I don't know. But, but it also what? felt powerful, right. of course. It's one of those things you try it, and if it works right away, it's like, oh, anybody can do this. You know, of course it's got to mm -hmm. be difficult. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a thing. So uh, <laughs> how did you, how did you uh, actually start doing this pop culture style that you have, as you called it? You know, I started um, around 2005. Okay. Um, and 
it's it's kind of funny because like the timing of it kind of coincided with with when Mad Men was coming out. But at the time, I didn't have cable and I wasn't watching Mad Men. It was right. just kind of stuff that I'd always liked. And I ended up doing a series of um, I, I based them on like vintage advertising advertising styles. Mm-hmm. I called it the ad series, and they were all like big paintings that all focused on different things that I was dealing with in my career as an artist. So like lack of affordable healthcare. And obviously this is before Obamacare came about, um, lack of affordable housing and studio space, um, stereotypes that people have against artists, you know, just different things like that. So each painting kind of focused on a different facet of that, Mm -hmm. but incorporated the pop culture. And then, um, I also, that was my first time using text and humor in my work. Okay. At this time, um, I don't know if you remember the big like scrapbooking craze that was really huge for a while. They had like, you know, whole stores dedicated to this stuff. Yeah. And you could buy rub on transfer lettering, just books of it, you know, in whatever font you wanted. So I would pick up all these things and you had to cut apart each letter individually and (laughs) transfer it onto the canvas over the paint and it was really tedious and time consuming but that's that's where all of this started was really that series and i just, just because of, of the letters or uh, how how i'm, I'm curious um, like what were you first of all what were you painting before that what was the style before this evolved into that it was more it was still kind of retro inspired but it was more like patterns and things like that i was really big into you know, Pucci prints and okay. Marimekko and, you know, like that kind of style. I wasn't really focused on having people in my work. Okay. Um, you know, I had done some of that in college, but I was like, eh, I'm not a portrait artist. Right. Um, and uh, I just wanted to branch out and do something different. And then uh, focusing on the whole like advertising format, you know, the advertisements have people in them and they're very text focused and, yeah. you know, so it Slogans really ends and all that. It, yeah. It totally changed the direction of my work because I had to make it fit within the parameters of what, you know, a 1950s advertisement would be. Okay. And you said that the applying those type of letters was tedious. What did you end up doing with the letters after that? Cause you're still using letters in there, but they're, different now are you just hand drawing them are you using uh computer generated fonts like how are you doing that so for a while after after using the you know individual letters i found this stuff where you could um these sheets of transfer film that you could run through a printer so i would do the lettering in photoshop and pick whatever font i wanted and then print it out and then apply it that way. So I could do like, you know, entire sentences. And mm-hmm. then they stopped doing that. Oh, geez. So you can't do that anymore. So now I actually, I, I hand paint any lettering that goes in. And I try not to do anything super um, tiny or detailed, you know, I try to keep it big enough where I can do it by hand and it's not a mess. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you just. <laughs> The technology changes and you just have to adapt to it. So, right. Yeah, of course. And how many works do you, uh, would you say that you put out in a year? Uh, I know that you said you also do commissions too. So, uh, how, how many paintings does that mean that you're making all the time? It depends on what I'm working on. Like last year, when I was really focused on getting that mural done, that mm-hmm. really cut down on the work I that I was that. doing. So, you know, I think I got maybe 10 pieces done last year, including the mural. Um, I don't have that quite a bit. It is. And I'm a slow painter. So, you know, I don't I don't rush through the process. It's not like abstract expressionism where I can just throw the paint on the canvas and be messy and call it good because I'm I'm so detailed. Right. So, um, you know, I'm working on commissions right now, actually, and. You know, I think I've already got like four pieces under my belt for for 2023. So, I mean, granted, they're smaller because people are asking for smaller work. But, um, yeah, it all depends on the size and what what is wanted from me at the time. So, OK, um, how yeah. do you go about getting commissions? A lot of times I'll just um put something out on social media saying commissions are open. If you want one, let me know. 
Um, last year I got a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board and I had written the grant to do a, a body of small work based on a bunch of blank canvases that I already had at home. So I put all the sizes up on social media and said, if you want a commission of one of these, let me know and I can give you a, a price. And, you know, they're all, I think the biggest was 11 by 14. So they're not super huge. I tried to keep them pretty affordable. And um, so some people are just like, oh, I want the canvas panel in eight by 10, you know, and then I want it framed. So then give them the estimate and if they agree to it, go for it. Um, okay. You know, otherwise sometimes, they'll, you know, I've, I've got somebody that just hired me to do a logo for their band. So oh, nice. um, yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that, um, you know, and they're just like, can you do this? These are, kind of the ideas I have in mind and just go for it and, and then get it done. So, cool. yeah, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people just want things for their house, you know, something that you can't buy at target or, right. Yeah. You know, gold or something. And then some people want something specific. I did a poster last year for a guy who does um, comedy shows and he had a, oh. a comedian coming in who was kind of a bigger name and he wanted a poster that was, a reproduction of an old Lenny Bruce poster from oh, the late nice. 60s. So he had me paint this guy in the style of Lenny Bruce on that poster. So <laughs> you just, you don't exactly know what you're going to get, but it, it keeps you on your toes and stretches your artistic muscles. So Yeah. And I like, it, I like the, the reasoning behind all of those too. It really fits the work from what I've seen of what you do. That's super awesome. It was like the people found it because they were like, well, I want something that is sort of like a pop art sort of recreation or uh, reimagining of these type of things. And that's, uh, yeah, that fits perfectly. I like that. Yeah. Do, do you apply for grants often? Uh, grants are things that I've only learned about a few years ago. And I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm never going to spend any time trying to apply for one. And I don't know where to look for them. So do you do that often? I do. I feel like I'm doing it all the time. Um, and, and it's a numbers game. You know, I mean, granted, the more practice you have, the better you get. You kind of know what funders are looking for. Mm -hmm. But um, it's the more you apply, the more likely you are to get something, you know. Like if you apply for 10, hopefully you get one. Yeah. Um, but it, it, as an artist, it's, it's the only way that you can sustain yourself in addition to commissions and things like that. You got to like go out and make the opportunities happen. So is there a website or something where you can search for them? Like, like uh find me a grant.com or something like yeah, that. There's actually, there um, so here in the Twin Cities, there's an organization called Springboard for the Arts. Okay. They have an entire page on their website of grants. Um, there's an organization in New York, um, New York Foundation for the Arts, and they have a site called NYFA Source, N-Y-F-A. Okay. And it's just, you can um, go into their database and you can narrow it down by discipline, by uh, location, if it's international, like whatever, and it's grants, residencies, fellowships, whatever. Um, if it's for um, a specific population, like if it's just for BIPOC people, or if it's just for women or whatever, like you can narrow all of that down and it'll come up with a list of everything that fits your criteria. Okay. And then go off of that. So, all right. And a lot of it too is just like, I find a lot of things on Instagram oh. and then I'll end up signing up for their mailing list. So when they have um, an open call, I'll get an email and then, Oh yeah, I got to remember to do that. So. Okay. So what you're really saying is I just need to put in the stupid work if I really want to do it. I shouldn't be complaining. Oh, I guess I'm not complaining, but yeah, it's like, you know, I'm going, it was so hard. I had to go to like five different websites just, to, you know, yeah, you're right. It's, it's like another part-time job. Yeah. Basically. And, and I'm lucky that I have a background in nonprofit leadership. That's so true. Like, yeah. I had in, in my graduate studies, I took an entire course on grant writing and, and in my um, arts administrative work, I did a lot of grant writing for that. So, I mean, I'm used to it, but yeah, it's a ton of work and it takes time away from you actually creating anything, mm -hmm. which is the frustrating part because it's like, well, if I could like create more then right. how much how much more money would I be making if I sold this stuff or 
at a show as opposed to sitting here writing a grant I may or may not get. That's a, yeah, both are valid points. Exactly. It's like you could put in the time and moving your stuff around and get paid for however much you get at like some market or pop up show or like even putting it wholesale into some retail place. Mm-hmm. And yeah. yeah that's, and I guess that's more the route I go. I go for the online route, but um, do you do a lot of pop ups or uh, markets or anything like that? I did during the holidays. Okay. Um, you no, know, being being kind of new to Minneapolis yet, I'm still kind of putting the feelers out there to see what's available. But um, yeah, I was in three holiday markets nice. um, at Christmas time, and that went really well. And then I'm I'm slowly getting on mailing lists for other ones, trying to expand mm-hmm. my network. I I haven't done any of the outdoor ones, so I'm mainly focusing on the ones that are like at breweries or yeah. you know like cross craft drama things like that but um yeah i'm hoping to do more of that okay and you also mentioned when we started the show that you're a musician as well have you been playing out while you're there <laughs> yeah but all of my gigs have been down in mankato <laughs> <laughs> um so my band is down there um i moved up to minneapolis last year our synth player moved to saint paul just recently so now half the band is in the metro and half is in southern minnesota but we're making a record right now um oh. i'm actually heading down there next week to start um uh, recording my guitar parts i do lead guitar and backing vocals so um once we got the record done i'm hoping we'll have some more gigs and we can like work our way up to playing in Minneapolis more and, <laughs> and uh, I won't have to drive so far. So how long has the band been together? You know, we got together in August of 2021. So about a really? year. Yeah. What were you doing yeah. before that then? If that was when you, that was just when you got a band together? Well, that was this band. Okay. Um, All right. I've been, I've been playing since I was 16. Okay. In All right. Band. But you know, with COVID, it really like nobody, nobody was playing live shows at all. So just me practicing on the couch at home, which not great. And then, you know, when COVID restrictions eased up, then I got asked to join this band. So they were already a three piece and they asked me to join last. And I was like, yeah. And and we're an all, all girl band, which I love. So um, Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be in one of those. So what's the name of the band? Uh, we're called Given Names. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's super great. We're indie pop. I love playing with those guys. It's fun. And yeah, yeah. I'm excited for the album to finally come out. So. Where are you recording it at? Uh, we're recording it in Mankato. Um, our lead singer, excuse me, <clears throat> our lead singer has a studio. Okay. That we record at and rehearse at. Okay. So, uh, I wasn't sure if you were going into a studio down there or because I was like, you know, there are studios in Minneapolis you could record at, but you're doing it. You're doing it in someone's setup that they already have down there. That makes yeah. more sense to me to actually go yeah. all the way. Because I'm like, you live somewhere where there are far more options for recording. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but we get to use their space for free. And right. we're not on a timeline. No, 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 no. you don't have to explain it to me. I, we no, we okay. self-record all of our stuff too. So it's <laughs> you don't have to yeah. explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just, it works out well. So our, our manager, who is actually her husband, um, you know, he's a musician too. So like his band is recording there and okay, it's nice that we already have this space built in. And- well, and it sounds like it's probably got a good setup too. Like if you have other bands going there, it means, well, the equipment's probably pretty above par for most normal uh, home yeah. recorded studios. So yeah, I mean they they have a really nice setup down there, and and everybody knows what they're doing, and like it's it's gonna be professionally done. Oh yeah, We're just, uh, no. In this day and age, uh, yeah, you it's 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 not that hard to think that it's gonna sound good. I mean, with the abilities and the uh, the amount of time and effort that people put into setting up these things so that it does sound good. Like it's, yeah, it's gone far beyond the days of, uh, just, you know, plugging it into a mic and recording it on the computer. I know what you mean. Oh, it's, yeah. And stuff. yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and you also started a virtual gallery. So I only just saw this when I was, uh, so I was pulling up some notes that I had for you and I went to your website again 
And on your Instagram, it said uh, there was a link in your link tree to a virtual gallery. And I was like, wait, I missed that last time. Is this something fairly new? Did you just start this? or Because I missed I, it last time I looked. I officially launched it in November. Oh, okay. So it has been there a little while. Yeah, it's been in the works for more than a year. Um, but it's, you know, it's only been a couple months that it's been live. So mm -hmm. the first exhibition is in there right now. It, um, I just did an open juried call for two dimensional work. Um, I use a software called art placer and it only allows for two dimensional work to be shown because yeah. you're in a virtual reality gallery where like you can walk around and see the art on the walls, but, but that's they the only they 3d thing. Yeah. yeah. So you can put a sculpture in there or fiber art or something. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I've got the second call for artists out now. So hopefully the, the next show will be launching at the beginning of March. Um, but it's been going really well. I, you know, I've, I've done curating in person at, um, different arts organizations and I've always loved doing it. And that's one of the things I really missed about my executive director job. And now I'm like, well, I don't have to wait for somebody to give me a job. I can start this and do it on my own. And because it's all virtual, we have artists from different countries. Um, and I'm trying to keep it affordable because we don't have rent. We don't have mm -hmm. to worry about people shipping artwork and all of that. So it's giving more artists an opportunity to sell their work, to be seen, to make money. Um, Does it have a I, way for them to like, when people look at their art, there's an option for them to buy it from the artist. Yes. So I'm not oh. taking a cut on any of the sales. Um, I, I charge 10 bucks per image for a submission fee just for my time and to help pay for the website and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm letting the artist keep hundred percent of the sales okay. because there are so many opportunities that I've had to pass on because I couldn't afford it because you got to pay like 50 bucks for one image to be submitted. And then you got to ship your work to and from the gallery and they take like at least a 50% cut. Of the service sales. itself does. Yeah. Okay. So, I know, I know how expensive it is and I wanted to make this something that's accessible um, and, and fair to the artists because it's hard making a living yeah. <laughs> training for artwork, you know? So if, if there's something I can do to help more artists make income from what they're doing, I figure this is the way to do it. How so, hard was it to set up? You know, it's it's not too bad. Um, I set up Google Forms for the submissions, and you mm -hmm. can have people attach images. And then I have a PayPal account where they pay the submission fee. And then as far as the, the actual software for the gallery, I just upload all the images and all the information on each piece and the artists and everything. And then once it's all uploaded, I can just place it on the walls in the gallery in whatever order I want. And then... You know, once it's up there, you can kind of see where things need to be moved around. And then you just shift it, shift the order of the pieces okay. and it'll change where they are. Huh. So it's really not super complicated. And I'm not a tech person. So if I can okay. do it, then anybody can. So. How did you how did you come up with the idea and even discover that this software was out there? Well, I've been using their software for a few years now for... Um, placing my art in like fake room settings for oh, my really or things like that. So, you know, you can either upload a real room or you can use their library and then put your painting on the wall. And why were so, you doing that to begin with? It was, this was just to see what it would look like or to take a picture of it. Like what was the purpose for that? For marketing, okay. for um, letting people see like, if I buy this and I have an office, what might this look like? You know, okay. And so I had already been using it for that. And then just in the last couple of years, they added gallery spaces and they're like, well, if you're an artist, you can have an entire virtual gallery. And of course this is the pandemic. Yeah. Nobody's having in-person shows anymore. I feel like it's something that they probably already had and then realized there's an opportunity for more people to use it if they were able to have broader access to it. Like I'm sure it was some sort of executive, like only release to businesses sort of thing or actual yeah. museums maybe. 
Yeah. I swear I've seen it before. And I think I've seen it before for an actual museum. Like they recreated their museum and you could do a walkthrough. Yes. Yeah. So like there are institutions that will do this. So you yeah. can look like their space. Um, the, the software that, or the, the package that I have, like there's some generic gallery right. space. But you can alter like the color of the floor or the the walls or the lighting, and you can you can make it fit whatever you need it to be. So you're not stuck with just blank template. You can you know customize it a little bit. So uh -huh. that has been nice. And then you can add you know they always have like the vinyl lettering on the walls with the name of the show and the info and stuff. You can put that yeah. on there and uh, recreate that kind of a space. So. This reminds me of what you were saying earlier about the mural thing where you found this service that was doing something else or you saw, you know, and you applied it to using it for a different purpose or for a, a, a purpose that suited something you wanted to do. And this is like the same thing, like you were just using it for marketing and it's like, well, why don't I create this gallery yeah. for people? I, I like that. Well, one of the nice things about being a creative person is that we're pretty good at adapting to change or going, what can I use this for? What else would this be good for? <laughs> yeah. Or like, I, I want to do this thing. Like, like I've always wanted to have a gallery and I always thought it was going to be the nonprofit route. And it was going to be brick and mortar. Well, that all changed. Now it's like, well, this exists. Why don't I use this? Mm -hmm. This will make my life easier and it's way cheaper and I can actually do this all by myself. So it's just, learning to adapt to what's out there and and you just have to kind of make your own opportunities instead of waiting for people to hand them to you yeah man and you also have a cart on your site as well correct I so do. you also sell your own work so when you now when you set these up and you say you do like maybe 10 a year are you selling prints and paintings and uh, like how are you producing these things that you're selling yeah, so I do I do original paintings, acrylic. I do mixed media paintings that have collage elements in them. Um, I do fine art prints. A lot of times um, the prints are work that's already sold, but if somebody still wants it, then it's still available. And oh, then so when somebody buys the painting itself, you're saying you'll create a print of it, so then you could just keep selling that even though somebody else bought the original. Duh. Yeah. Okay, yep, I gotcha. That's, for some reason, that was just like, oh, yeah. But see, most of my stuff is digital, so I don't really think of that. Mine is just yeah. like everything is a print that I could do. Okay, well, yeah. Everything that I create, I have to document. So mm -hmm. you know, I have a nice camera set up with a DSLR and everything because you have to have all this, these images for grant applications and exhibits and stuff. And it's like, yeah. why not just turn that into a print in Photoshop? And then, you know, so I can sell them in different sizes. The artwork's still available. It's at a cheaper price point for people who can't afford an original. Um, yeah, it just, it just makes more sense. It's more accessible to a wider audience that way. Okay. And you're using uh, Squarespace for that? I am. Okay. Yeah. How do you like using Squarespace? I know, I, I mean, I know it's, uh, it's an easy to use site, but it can be, well, I, I mean, it's sort of pricey and sometimes it's like, I, I've never used their actual cart. I've set up the cart for people, but I've never actually worked with it. Like is Okay. Yeah. You know, um, I've actually, I've had a really good experience with it. I mean, mm -hmm. my previous web website was in WordPress okay. and being somebody who can't code, like it was. And you probably had WooCommerce for your cart on that one. I'm assuming. Yeah. Right? Like the whole thing was just a struggle for me, even just to update it. Yeah, I don't like WooCommerce. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I love Squarespace and the fact that it's like drag and drop. You can move things around. You can change the templates. Like mm -hmm. there are a few things that are a little frustrating in terms of like you have a vision in your head of what you want something to look like and you can't quite make it happen with right. the template. But being somebody who doesn't know HTML, it's nice to know that I can just do this myself. And if yeah. I need to update a resume or add something to the shop, I can do it in 10 minutes and, and it's done. Um, yeah. So I like it for that respect. Okay. All right. And yeah, I was just curious about the cart and how, how seamless it was as well too. Just cause like I said, I've never, I've never actually used it. I've had to work with people on WooCommerce and actually set up their store and then also help fix the problems that they had with WooCommerce. Oh or do things that way. Yeah. 
and and you know what? For the amount of money that WooCommerce asks you to uh, pay them for their service, it, it, they should fix it themselves. Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, I shouldn't have to alter all this code or like try to set something up the way the customer wants when they pay all that money for it. So right. that's just my little rant about companies that charge too much for their service and don't do anything. <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, it also, do you, uh, do you, how do you promote the work that you do? Do you advertise or is it just, you put the, you, you know, you put stuff out on social media, you just have a lot of friends, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I have my website, I have social media accounts on, um, Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter, um, and I have a TikTok account, which is more for the music side of things, Okay, but I do have that. And then, um, I try to be really active with my social network, um, especially I've noticed with Twitter, I've actually grown my network a ton and that's helped me to get press for the new gallery here in Minneapolis because okay. I've connected with people I didn't know before and I've gotten interviews and things like that. And then, you know, I've donated some work to like some mutual aid things um, and, and people saw that and then they ended up coming and buying from me. And, oh, wow. Um, you know, it's just like, the more you give, the more you get. And if you're like social and you actually talk to people and respond to them and, and like are involved and get to know them as, as friends, like that does a ton right there. So even if you've never met in person, they're super supportive of your work and they're buying prints and they're, you know, like promoting your gallery for you. And they're like more than happy to do those things because they know that you're going to support what they're doing too. Yeah. Okay. So you, and so you don't advertise or have you ever dabbled? You know, I've, um, I've been looking into it. I, yeah. I, really Not that you have to, I'm just curious. I'm always curious about people's take on advertising and also yeah. you how know, difficult I, it can be sometimes. I try to keep everything as free as possible. So like, oh, yeah, me too. And, and that kind of stuff. But, you know, I've looked into advertising into things like, you know, Atomic Ranch magazine. I don't know if you read oh, that at all. Okay. You know, like the mid-century style. I'm like, oh, well, that'd be a good fit. And then you look at the prices and it's like, wow, I can't afford right. to pay 300 bucks for a, an ad the size of a business card, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> some, not now. So hmm. I'll, I'll work my way up to that. Okay. And then uh, do you have anything coming up in the future or some projects that you're working on that you'd like to tell people about? Oh, uh, yeah. So um, I'm collaborating with a friend of mine. His name's Tony Placido. He's a poet. And we are working on a joint project that's going to culminate in an exhibition. So I gave him five images. He gave me five poems. And then we're each creating five new works based on the stuff that we got from the other person. Oh, cool. So at the end of it, we'll have... 10 paintings and 10 poems that all relate to each other. And then we're going to show that in an exhibition space. Um, I'm, this is in the very, very, very preliminary um, stages right now, but I'm working with people, contacting people about trying to get um, a Mary Tyler Moore mural oh, in Minneapolis. Nice. So I'm just in the talking stages with a lot of people right now and, waiting for something to be finalized. We'll see. And then um, the next show in my online gallery is going to open in March. So I'll be curating that and, and getting that launched. I think it opens March 7th. So okay, yeah. So I'm working on those. A lot of stuff coming up. I like that. Okay. Yeah. And if people wanted to see more about what you do or learn about your online ga gallery, where would you suggest they go? Uh, so my my website is amandawirig.com and Wirig is W-I-R-I-G. Um, there is a link to my gallery in the navigation bar. It's called 119 North Weatherly. Um, otherwise, you can go to 119northweatherly.com and see just the gallery. Um, it's got a, a link to the current show and then the call for artists that's out right now, plus the press that we've gotten and things like that. So, And then I'm on all social media accounts. Um you know, Amanda Weirig or 119 North Weatherly, Minneapolis. So. Well, great. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. It was great meeting you. Oh, it was great meeting you too. Thank you so much.